about you, but when, whenever I, I think about or read passages that talk about the temptation of Jesus, there's a part of me, honestly, that kind of feels uncomfortable with the whole idea. Jesus being tempted? I mean, how on earth can you tempt the Son of God? What would that look like? How is that even possible? Now, I was thinking through the last few days, why is it that I always feel kind of squeamish, even unearthing that subject? Why is it that I'm not fully comfortable with it? And, and I think part of it, at least for me, is um, the background, my story. Um, as many of you know, I wasn't born in a Christian home. But every now and then, my parents would take my sister and I to church, and it was this Anglican church in England. And I remember on the wall of this Anglican church, they had this portrait of Jesus, and I, I still remember what it looked like. I remember as a kid staring at it and always thinking that Jesus seemed otherworldly. He wasn't quite human. Just the way that this portrait was, he had this halo around his head and he was glowing and radiating and he had this blonde hair that was permed and wondering how that works in the Middle East, right? And, and, and there's just something about him that I remember even as a kid thinking, He's not fully man, right? Like when he walks, he must not touch the ground. He just has this aura about him. And yet when you read the word, what you discover is, sure, yeah, Jesus was fully God. He was fully divine, but he was also fully man. And he also went through temptations and struggles that we all encounter as well. In fact, if you're taking notes, jot this down. In the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet he did not sin. So you see what the author of Hebrews is saying there is, look, when Jesus became, or when God became a man, he experienced all the struggles, all the issues, all the temptations that we experience, which means then, he says, that we have a high priest who can relate to us because he was tempted, he is then able to help us in our seasons of temptation as well. And so as we get into this passage, we need to know this isn't just a story of Jesus' temptation. Sure, it's that, it's historical, and we can learn a lot about the time, and we can learn about Jesus' life from it, but it's also about your story and my story, because what when Jesus went through is really a template of what we will go through and are going through, and how Jesus overcame is a template for how we can overcome as well. And so the story begins, verse one, check it out, it says, Says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. I guess so. Like, I get hungry after 40 minutes. Could you imagine 40 days in the wilderness? He has nothing to eat, he's famished. So the story begins, it says that Jesus is led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness. Now, for those of you who have been to Israel, um, you know that this part of Israel is one of the most desolate, barren, arid, miserable places on earth. Like it's really, really dry, a very, very difficult place to survive. In fact, uh, back in November, some of you know, I uh, had a chance to, to do a pastor's conference along with Jeff Quazo um, in the West Bank, and uh, we had a chance to spend some time with Palestinian Christians and go through the book of James with them. But the place where we met was actually at the base of what is believed to be the mountain of temptation. And uh, we actually have a, a slide of the picture uh, or of that part of Israel. As you can see, it's not your typical desert with rolling sand dunes and cactus. Instead, what you see are broken and twisted, uh, rocky gorges, limestone cliffs. Um, there's all kinds of extremes in temperature. Uh, during the day, it can get well over 100 degrees. At night, it can dip below freezing. Um, there's 
extremes to, in, of topography. You have the mountains of Judea, which then go down 3,000 feet to the Dead Sea, which is the lowest spot on earth. Um, the point is, this is one of the most barren, desolate places on earth. In fact, so desolate is it that the Jewish people gave it a nickname. They called it Yeshimon. Yeshimon means the place of desolation. So it's here into this Yashimon, the, the place of desolation, where Jesus now is being led by the Spirit of God to be tempted by the devil. Now, one of the things that's so fascinating to me about this story is when you compare it to the story that was right before. Remember how a few weeks ago we saw back in chapter 3 the story of Jesus' baptism. He goes to the Jordan River. There's this wild-haired, wild-eyed, locust-eating, wheatgrass-drinking hippie who's standing by the banks of the Jordan baptizing people, and Jesus comes to him, and he is baptized, and when he's baptized, he comes out the Spirit of God comes upon him in the form of a dove. The Father speaks from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. I mean, this was a mountaintop experience for Jesus. Hearing the voice of the Father, being empowered by the Spirit. I mean, this magisterial, climactic moment and the very next story, scholars believe it could have been the same day or the very next day, he then finds himself in a barren, desolate, dry wilderness, a place called Yeshimon. I mean, the contrast between these two stories couldn't be any greater. One moment, empowered by the Spirit of God, the next moment, his power is drained from him as day after day he's being tempted and tested and tried. One moment, he's hearing the voice of the Father, you are my beloved son. The next moment, he is hearing the voice of Satan himself who tests him and tries to get him to fall. I mean, the fact that these two stories are side by side, I think, is not coincidental because what the Lord is trying to teach us, I believe, is that life and our spiritual journey as we follow Christ is often that way, right? And there are times when you're at the Jordan, when you're hearing the voice of the Father, you're reading the word, it's coming alive, you pray, God speaks to you, you're empowered with the Spirit. It's like this wonderful season where God seems to be right there. You can almost touch him and he's opening up doors of ministry and opportunity and you're being moved and led by the Spirit. For some of you, that's where you're at. You right now are at the Jordan River. But for others, it's not so much the Jordan, it's the place of desolation, right? And right now, your walk with God maybe feels like a crawl, and you feel dry and barren inside. And when you pray, it's like your prayers are hitting the ceiling and bouncing back down. When you open the word, you may as well be reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's just not coming alive at all. Like, what on earth? God, where are you? Why is this happening? And you sense and you feel the attack of the enemy. Listen, the fact that these two stories are side by side for Jesus then tells us that in life we should not be surprised when the enemy comes at us to distract us and destroy us and drag us down, especially in those seasons where we are pressing into God. Those times in life when you're pursuing him with all of your heart when you're worshiping and, and living out his mission and living for his kingdom. Listen, the enemy's not gonna take that lying down. It's not like Satan says, oh, you wanna live for Jesus? That's wonderful. Hey, blessings on you, good luck. No, now he's gonna do everything in his power to oppose you. One pastor said, if you haven't had a head-on collision with the devil lately, it probably means you're heading in the same direction. Right? So if you're experiencing Yeshimon right now, if you're experiencing opposition, it's because you're going the right way. It's because you're doing the right thing. Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, he said, in this world, you will face tribulation. He didn't say in this world you might. 
a 50-50 chance. If you're lucky, maybe you'll get away with it. No, he says, you will. It's a done deal. It's a guarantee. You're going to face hardship. And the word for tribulation that Jesus uses is in the Greek, the word thlipsis. Thlipsis was an ancient form of torture. The Romans were really good at torturing people, right? They had this thing down. They took lessons from Jack Bauer or something, right? They knew how to torture. And what they would do is they would take their prisoner, lay them on the ground, put a plank on top of them, and then roll up a heavy boulder or stone on their chest. And what would begin to happen is that prisoner would start to choke and suffocate. They could exhale but not inhale, and their bones would begin to break. It was absolutely brutal. That's the word that Jesus uses for life. (laughs) He says, in this world, there's going to be thlipsis. And for some of us today, we've come in this place, and there is that heavy burden upon your chest. It feels like this last week, that the enemy's been coming after you with everything that he's got to distract you and destroy you and to tear you down. And sometimes the attack of the enemy is so strong and so severe, you can hardly breathe. Jesus knows what that is like. Jesus went into this place of flipsis where the enemy is throwing at him everything in his arsenal to try and destroy him and drag him down and dethrone him. Now, this raises the question, of course, how does Satan do this? How does he tempt Jesus? How do you tempt the Son of God? I mean, are we talking Krispy Kremes, Bojangles? Like, what what is this, right? How does he come against him? Well, check out verse 3, because we see the story unfold. It says, the devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. The devil then led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor it has been given to me. And I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished all this tempting, He left him until an opportune time. So here it is. This is how the enemy sought to bring Jesus down. Again, if you're taking notes, there are three separate areas of temptation. The first had to do with lust. We see that in verse three. He comes to him and says, hey, Jesus, command that these stones become bread. Now, can you imagine what a severe temptation that must have been for Jesus as he, for 40 days, had had nothing to eat. His body is screaming for food, for nourishment and sustenance. And for the enemy to do this, this was appealing to Jesus' natural desires. But more than that, what the enemy is doing is, look, Jesus, obviously your father isn't providing enough for you. You have the right, if you're the son of God, You can tell a stone to turn into bread. You can do whatever you want. You have the power and the authority. It doesn't matter what the cost may be. The only thing that matters, Jesus, is that you do whatever makes you feel good. Satisfy your flesh. No one's gonna know. No one's gonna see. We're out in the wilderness. Command that these stones become bread. Secondly, The enemy comes after him in the area of idolatry, verse 5. It says he brings him to a mountain. He shows him all the kingdoms of the world and says, look, I will give you all of these if you bow down and worship me. Why was this such a temptation for Jesus? Because Jesus had come for the kingdoms of the world. He has come to establish his kingdom and to restore and renew a broken humanity to bring them back to God. Essentially, what the devil is doing here is offering Jesus a shortcut away from Calvary. 
Oh, so you've come for the kingdoms of the world? Great. Jesus, I can give it to you. It's the bargain of the century. You won't need to die. No need to have a crown of thorns pressed into your skull. You can have people place a crown of authority on your head. No need to have your hands and your feet pierced. I'll have people come and kiss your hands and feet. There's no need for you to suffer or to be tortured or to go through the excruciating pain of Golgotha. No, Jesus, just bow down. Bow down. Worship me. And I will give you those things that you have come to pursue. You want the kingdoms? I'll hand them to you right now. So we see lust. Command the stones to become bread. We see idolatry. Bow down and worship me. Thirdly, he comes after him in the area of pride. In verse 9, he brings him to a temple. He says, throw yourself down, and angels will come, and they will rescue you. Hey, Jesus, it is time for you to show the world who you really are. Show them your power, your authority, your dominion, that you can summon a legion of angels at any given moment. They will rescue you. Hey, jump off this temple. They'll be right there. They will lift you up. You will not strike your foot against a stone. And then all the world will know and all the world will see your glory and your power. Again, what the enemy's trying to do is shortcut what Jesus had come to do as the servant to die for the sins of humanity. The enemy's jumping to the end of the story saying, now is the time. Hey, bungee jump off this thing. Everyone will know who you are are lust, pride, idolatry. Now, what's so interesting to me about these three things is that in the Old Testament, the children of Israel were tempted with the exact same things. In fact, if I could push this even more, I would argue that in many ways what Luke is doing is retelling the story of Israel. How so? Jesus was baptized. He passes through the water. He goes into the wilderness for 40 days. He experiences testing and trial and temptation and overcame. In the Old Testament, the children of Israel pass through the waters, right? The Red Sea, which Paul said is a picture of baptism. They go through the waters into the wilderness, not for 40 days, but for 40 years, and while they were in the wilderness, they are tempted, tested, and tried with the exact same temptations. First of all, in the area of lust, if you're taking notes, um, in the book of Numbers, chapter 11, we have the story of how God had provided for them bread from heaven. They called it manna. God gave them everything that they needed, but they began to lust for more, the text says. They began to long for what they thought were the good old days of Egypt. <laughs> they weren't good old days. They were slaves. But it's funny how our mind plays tricks on us. Oh, I remember those days before I knew Christ. It was so fun. You always remember the kick. You don't remember the kick back, right? You don't remember vomiting at two in the morning, right? You don't remember all the heartache and the, the broken stories. The enemy tries to lure us through sin, but the end of the road is destruction. For the children of Israel, they are lusting. Oh, we want to go back to Egypt. We want the, the cookout and the milkshakes and the wonderful things we had back then. It was so great, right? We're sick of manna, they were saying. We're sick of this bread. We've tried every possible combination. We've tried manna cotti. We've tried the manna splits. Like, <laughs> none of this is working. Give us more. They're lusting. They're lusting and they failed, right? They're tempted. It had to do with bread in the wilderness, and they fell short. Secondly, they're tempted in the area of idolatry. That classic story in Exodus 32, Moses is on Mount Sinai. He's seeking God. God's giving him the commandments. Meanwhile, down below, the children of Israel are like, where's our fearless leader? We don't even know where he is, so let's just build another God. So they make a golden cow. What on earth? Like, why a cow? It's like utterly <laughs> ridiculous. So Moses comes down off the mountain like, what on earth? Let's move on out of here. This is, this is horrific, right? <laughs> so bad, so horrible. 
So they're tempted in idolatry and fail miserably. Third temptation, pride. Jot it down, Exodus 17. They again begin to question Moses. Poor Moses. I mean, imagine leading these people. They're constantly conspiring against him and antagonistic towards him. In Exodus, they're like, let's just get rid of this guy and someone else can take his place, right? And they had this pride thinking that they could do what God had called Moses to do. And God had to show his power through Moses as he struck a rock and water began to flow from it. The point being is that the children of Israel are tempted and tested in the exact same areas that Jesus was tempted and tested by. But here's the key difference. Jesus passed the test, right? Jesus didn't fail. He didn't worship a cow, right? He didn't get into all the things that they did when they were in the wilderness. Jesus pushed back against the enemy. How? He quotes scripture. It is written. It is written. It is written. Quoting from Exodus and Deuteronomy, he brings the word of God because it was on his mind. It now flows out of his mouth. He pushes back against the enemy. He was in prayer and fasting, talking to his father. The story begins. He was filled with the spirit of God. And as the enemy comes after him with everything he possibly could, Jesus is able to push back. And it says that the devil fled from him. So Jesus did what Israel could never do. And this is Luke's way of saying this Jesus, this Messiah, not only can he relate to Israel because he was in the same wilderness, tempted with the same three things, but this Jesus is the hope of Israel because he overcame the temptation. Hebrews, as we saw, takes it a step further When the author says, look, not only is Jesus the hope of Israel, he's our hope as well because Jesus overcame temptation. He now gives us the power and the resources to overcome temptation as well. He can empathize with our weaknesses. Now, it's right here that this story collides with our story in 2014. (laughs) Because everything that's in this story, we experience, are experiencing, will experience, we can relate to what's going on here. Because the enemy will come after us. He is going to attack us. He is going to try his best to drag us down. That's the reality. I know it's not good news. In this world, you will face tribulation, right? It's gonna happen. But we need to know One advantage we have is that the enemy's playbook hasn't changed all that much. In fact, I would argue from the very, very beginning, his strategy to dismantle the human story has been the same, right? Adam and Eve, lust, oh, it's good for food. Idolatry, oh, it's gonna make me wise. Pride, I will become like one of a god's. Adam. Israel, Jesus, you and I, we are tempted in these same three things. In fact, I really think that you can take every temptation, every struggle of the flesh, every way that the enemy comes after you, and it will probably fall into one of these three categories. First of all, lust. Command these stones to become bread. Man, how the enemy wants to rip us apart in this area. And of course, at its core, lust is a desire for more. It's a dissatisfaction with what God has given to you. And lust will manifest itself in all kinds of destructive ways. Whether it's your thought life, the battle of the mind, whether it's things that you're taking in through music or or movies, TV, the internet, Man, my heart's been burdened lately as I've been meeting with several different people who struggle in this area of pornography. And it is an epidemic in our nation. Every second, any given second, 30,000 people are looking at pornography in our nation. Any given second, $3,000 is being spent on pornography. 12% of all websites 
are pornographic. Pornography reflects the endemic cruelty and violence of our society. It objectifies women. It strips them of their humanity and their dignity. It reduces them to commodities and objects. It fuels and it promotes sex trafficking. That's the ugly truth that many guys don't want to face up to. That when they look at pornography online, they're actually helping fuel this sick, sadistic, messed up slavery of which there are 30 million slaves right now in the world. We're helping promote that every time a website is clicked on. It tears apart marriages, it destroys homes, it corrupts men's minds and their view of women, and sad to say, for the most part, the church as a whole has not done much about it. It's one of this insidious, subtle snares that the enemy is using to take out men primarily, although some women struggle too, but primarily men, ripping them off, dehumanizing them as they dehumanize women. And it has to stop. And we have to be a community that draws the line in the sand and says, no, I will not command these stones to become bread. But you're in the wilderness. You're stressed out. You're going through hard times. No one knows. It's just a click. No big deal. Your needs aren't being satisfied. Come on, you can do it. Command the stones to become bread. It is the same satanic voice that far too many are giving into. Secondly, the enemy comes after us in this area of idolatry. What's an idol? You know, we often think of idolatry in terms of what happens in other nations, people bowing down to these little statues or what have you. But really, at its core, um, I like what the, the Jewish philosopher Halbertal said, that at its core, a, an idol is a pattern of life where you're taking something that's finite or created and you're turning it into a godlike absolute. In other words, an idol is something that you think you cannot live without. It's that thing that's on your mind. It's that thing you wake up to thinking about. It's that thing you go to bed thinking about. And it could be all kinds of things, whether it's in a sin or an addiction. It could be something good. It could be a relationship or even the ministry. It could be materialism, greed, whatever. Fill in the blank. An idol is anything that is seeking to replace God as bring first and foremost in our life. William Temple said that your religion is what you do in secret. It's not so much what we do here on Sunday mornings. Your religion is what you do when no one else is around. And if you're not careful, those idols will rob you and consume your identity, your vision, and your future. It's the same satanic temptation. All the kingdoms of the world are yours. Just bow down, worship me. Don't worship God, don't seek him first, don't make him your passion and priority. No, pursue these other things. So we wrestle with lust, commanding stones to become bread. We wrestle with this issue of idolatry, the idols of their age that have shown themselves to be opposed to God and to his kingdom. And we wrestle in this area of pride, every one of us. C.S. Lewis said that pride is the complete anti-God state of mind. Pride, it's that desire for recognition to be known and seen and lifted up. Throw yourself down. Show everyone how great you are. Of course, pride takes so many different forms, right? Some, some forms of pride are hidden and beneath the surface, whether it's spiritual pride or intellectual pride or false humility. Um, other forms of pride, it's like really obvious and you can spot it a mile away. I, I heard about Muhammad Ali a few months ago and I guess he was kind of known for being somewhat self-confident at certain points. And there's a true story of him once flying in a plane and the airline stewardess comes up to him and she's like, ah, sir, can you put on your seatbelt? We're, we're gonna be going through some turbulence. And he looks up at her, arms folded. Superman don't need no seatbelt. And he looks, or she looks back at him, brilliant answer. And she says, well, 
Superman don't need no plane either. <laughs> Get your seatbelt on. Now, some form of pride, it's really obvious like that, right? That Muhammad Ali Superman complex. But most forms of pride is that hidden, subversive pride where we're trying to put our best face forward and make everyone jealous of our life, a.k.a. Instagram. <laughs> How do I know that I wrestle with pride, and I do? How do you know that you wrestle with it? What's a good litmus test for us? Here is, I think, the best test. How is your prayer life? How's my prayer life? When I pray, it's a way of dethroning self. When I pray, it's a way of saying, God, I don't have this thing figured out. <laughs> when I pray, it's a way of saying, God, I need you, your grace, your mercy, your strength. You see, a lack of prayer means that I have become self-reliant, that I think somehow, whether consciously or subconsciously, that I can do this on my own. How is your prayer life, honestly? Are you seeking him? Are you spending time with him? Are you getting down on your knees? Are you talking to the Lord? If not, it means that we have given into the same satanic lie Throw yourself down. Show everyone how great you are. Angels will come. Just take God for granted. He'll be there. He'll do whatever you want. You don't need to seek him. Lust, idolatry, pride. Lust, idolatry, pride. Adam and Eve, Israel in the wilderness, Jesus in the wilderness. And today for us in 2014, these are the same areas he comes after us again and again and again to try and distract and derail and destroy us. And here, here's the bad news. We have all failed, <laughs> right? We've all messed up. Every single one of us, lust, we've given in idolatry. How many times in my life have I pursued other things rather than God? Pride. How many times in my life where I haven't been seeking God like I ought to have? That's the bad news. We come in here broken, messed up, fallen, hurting, wounded, and in desperate need of God's grace. But here's the good news. Because if I just left it there, that would be a real bummer of a sermon, right? <laughs> Hey, guess what? You've all messed up, so have I. Enjoy your day. Okay, I don't know if I want to go back to that church anymore, right? <laughs> Here's the good news. This story in Luke chapter 3, which I am, or 4, I'm so glad is here, is a way of God telling us, listen, yeah, you failed, yeah, you've messed up, but there is one who was tempted just like you. And there is one who went through the same wilderness just like you, who has been in a place of Yeshimon and desolation, who was oppressed and afflicted, and the enemy came after him with everything in his power, but he overcame. He had victory. And this one who went through that same wilderness is able to give you the power and resources to overcome as well. That is good news. Yeah. Praise God, right? Jude, Jude 124 says this. Great verse to write down. I say 124, there's only one chapter there, but it says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. For some, that is the word of the Lord for you. That's why God brought you here today, to hear that verse. You, you're struggling, you're stumbling, you're hurting, you're wrestling with the flesh, but there is one who is able to keep you from that. Now, that doesn't mean we're gonna be perfect. We're gonna all gonna wrestle until the day we die, right? We're all gonna go through it, but hopefully what God is doing is sanctifying us and cleansing us and bringing us from glory to greater glory. And through this text, what it's reminding us is that this Jesus isn't aloof or distracted or removed from us, but he walks with us through the wilderness and he says, okay, let me give you resources for victory. Let me help you in this struggle of lust and idolatry and pride. First of all, the same word that Jesus quoted from 
is available for us to read, to study, to memorize, to dig into. I'll jot this down in the book of Psalms 119, and really, the whole book is about the word of God. But it says in verse nine, how can a young man cleanse his way but by taking heed according to the word of God? You skip ahead a couple verses in verse 11. It says, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. The word of God is living and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. And for too many of us, we go out into battle. We take on the enemy and we haven't bothered to take out what is our strongest weapon, the sword. How many soldiers would go out into battle with nothing to fight with? Of course you're gonna get ripped off. Of course the enemy's gonna drag you down. Break it out, read it, dig into it, study it, memorize it. That's what you're doing this morning, preaching to the choir, but let's keep it up. Jesus said, it is written, it is written, and the enemy fled from him. Secondly, the same spirit that empowered Jesus and anointed Jesus is available for us to give us strength and power as we wrestle with the flesh. The Bible says it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. You see, we're not talking about resolutions here. We're not talking about the little engine that could, I think I can, I think I can, I'll try harder and harder and harder to do better. No, we're talking about a brokenness before the presence of God saying, God, I cannot do this on my own. I cannot fight these demons on my own. And I'm inviting your spirit to empower me and anoint me and equip me and enable me because once you fill me, God, I know that through you I can do all things. Ask and you shall receive, Jesus said. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. The Spirit of God is available for you right here and right now. And finally, the same power and potential of prayer is yours as well. Jesus was talking to his Father. He was in fellowship with his Father as he's walking through the shadow of death. The Father was there for him. Hebrews says, let us therefore boldly enter the throne of grace, that we may find grace and mercy to help in our time of need. The Lord wants to speak to you. He wants to answer your prayer. He wants to show you the way. And we have not because we ask not. The same resources that Jesus had as he fought back on the enemy are yours right here and right now. And we serve a God that no matter what the enemy throws our way, he gives us, through him, the ability to overcome. The only question is, is do you want that? Right? That's what it boils down to. Paul, he talked about this in Romans 6. We're gonna get into this Friday morning. Paul said, the old you is dead. It's buried in the ground. It's been crucified with Christ. You have been raised from the dead. And then he says this in Romans 6, verse 21, reckon the old man dead. Now that's how we know Paul was from the south. (laughs) Reckon the old man dead, right? It simply means, hey, it's a done deal. You are a new creation. The chains are broken. The door is is open, so why on earth are you hanging out in that prison cell of sin and addiction? There's the door. I have these chains. Well, you put those chains on yourself. Shake them off. Come on, walk out. The victory is yours because of what Christ did for you. You know, this afternoon, we'll we'll all watch the game, but we we already know that the Seahawks will win, right? Like, it's... It's gonna happen, right? Like, Jesus loves the Seahawks. He's, he's for the underdog. The last shall be first, right? <laughs> we all know that's gonna happen. Now, sure, it may be close. They'll win by three. Um, but, but we know the end of the story. That's what Paul is saying. We know the end of the story. A day is coming when all the idols and sins and temptations and struggles of the flesh will disintegrate in the presence of the kingdom of God. The old will pass away and all things will become new. That's your future. Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead is your past. Here in your presence, he's giving you the power to overcome. And the question is, 
How now will you live? When I say no to the flesh, I am bringing into the present what is God's plan for the future. God's plan for the future is a world where justice and love and shalom and no more degradation and objectification of women and no more pornography, no more greed and materialism and slavery. God's future for the world is when all those things will be put to an end. When I say yes to God and his kingdom now, I am bringing into the present what is God's purpose for the future. The Lord invites us today to step into that. So here's my question for every one of us. Do we want that? Do we want to be set free? Do you really want to be set free? For some, sadly, maybe even here today, like, you don't want to be. You like that sin. You like that addiction. It's your functional Messiah. It's your go-to quick fix. And there's nothing we can do for you. God's not going to force you to be free. But for those of us who would say, I am so sick of the flesh, I'm so sick of pride and idolatry and lust, I'm so sick of my selfishness, I'm so sick of greed, I'm so sick of materialism, God, I want your kingdom. For those of us who want to pursue God and live in holiness and victory and power, Jesus invites us to come right now, and he says, come to me when you are weary and heavy laden and take my yoke upon you. Let me bring rest and peace and joy and victory. Today, Jesus invites you to give to him the darkest places of your heart. Will we say yes to that invitation? Let's stand, shall we?